Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this really special program in honor of President's Day. My name is Mark Lawrence. I am the director of the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library and Museum here in Austin, Texas. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to what I think will be a really fantastic opportunity to reflect on American history and the history of the American presidency in particular in a truly unusual way through music. And my guest this morning is Ted Nash, who is an enormously talented musician and composer, a longtime member of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, and the creator of the Grammy award-winning album called Presidential Suite. In this incredibly interesting album, Ted Nash transforms key moments from some of the most famous speeches of the 20th century that were focused on the cause of freedom into a truly lushly orchestrated suite of modern jazz. Please join me in welcoming Ted Nash. Ted, it's wonderful to have you. Thanks so much for making time to be with us. Oh, Mark, it's, it's certainly my, my pleasure. I, I can't say what an honor it is to be joined by you and uh, the LBJ Library and talk about this, which is, it's, it's so beautiful for me to be able to share this, especially in this context of President's Day. So thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate that. This is such an interesting and unusual, I, I even dare say unique piece of, of music. Hmm. And we'll share in a few minutes some clips that will give everyone a better sense of exactly uh, what this piece consists of. But before we get there, talk a little bit about what inspired you to undertake this project. Yeah, well, so uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, I've been a member of the, of the orchestra for uh, 22 years now. Winston Marsalis is uh, my leader, my band leader, and uh, runs Jazz at Lincoln Center. And he, um, over the years, he has basically commissioned different members of the band and people outside the band to write pieces of music for the orchestra. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great honor to be able to, to do this and be able to uh, arrange and compose for the orchestra, which, you know, being a member of it for so long now, I've become really intimate in terms of my understanding of how these musicians play and who they are. So to have this opportunity is really incredible. And for this particular uh, piece, you know, he just, he's not saying you got to do this or I have this idea. He just says, man, I want you to write some music. Let me know, you know, let me know what your idea is. So I thought about it and I had been kind of messing around a little bit with the flow and the cadence of speeches, but it was something I had kind of, you know, put, put in the back burner, I suppose. And um, as I started to think about um, what would inspire me to write really new material, like something that would challenge me and also cause me to, um, I don't know, come up with, with thematic material and different harmonies and things that maybe I wouldn't come up with on my own, just sitting at the piano and, uh, and, and starting from scratch. And so I started thinking about speeches and the cadence of them uh, and that, you know, they have a certain kind of flow and I began to listen to them. And then I made the decision that I would do uh, a suite of music based on different political speeches. And I chose political speeches um, because it was important to me to embrace part of my mythology, my growing up, which is that I have parents who are civil rights activists. And I think that that has helped uh, me be aware of the struggle and the, the fight for human rights and freedom, civil rights. Uh, so I began to kind of narrow down my search for, for speeches that, that dealt with this theme. The piece includes eight speeches. Uh, including four U.S. presidents, John F. Kennedy, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, and of course, Lyndon Johnson, more about that in, in just a minute, but also Winston Churchill, Nelson Mandela, Aung San Suu Kyi, and Jawaharlal Nehru. How did you arrive at this lineup of, of speeches? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because uh, they're diverse, certainly. Um, I mean, fairly diverse in terms of their, their, their political uh, background um, and, and other things, obviously. But uh, it was hard to, to narrow, narrow it down. And this, this, the same thing happened to me when I did a piece called Portrait in Seven Shades, where I dealt with iconic paintings. It's like, how do you narrow it down? How do you choose? And, and, 
and just uh, limit it to seven or eight pieces that are going to make an entire suite. And for me, uh, as I began to listen to speeches, uh, yes, they had to deal with with a certain cadence and a, and a certain flow that would that would that would sort of inspire me musically. But the, the main thing, the thing that really made it important, really made me choose was if it moved me emotionally, if it if it had some kind of a strong impact on me, um, if it brought tears to my eyes, if it made me think much more about a particular time or, or struggle. Um, but the speech itself had to move me. So that that's kind of where, you know, those choices were made. And certainly the, the first inauguration of JFK, it's just an incredible speech, one of the best. Reagan, who was a great speaker, um, you know, I mean, he talked, he had a great speech about the, the Challenger disaster, but it wasn't a, a political human rights type of speech. So, um, but I did have a long list. I had like, you know, I had a list of, you know, 25 speeches and I kept narrowing it down until I came to this list of the people that you just read. And the only one, one of my criteria, you know, kind of regulations uh, in, in choosing um, requirements was that I could transcribe it. So it was, um, either in video or in audio form. And there was only one that was an exception to that. And that was Aung San Suu Kyi, whose speech was actually an essay and it was written. So that, that was an exception. So is it a hallmark, would you say, of great memorable oratory that it has a musical feel to it? I think so. I think that, you know, great speech, um, it can. I mean, if you, if you look at some of the different people that I chose, I mean, LBJ, he's very colorful, and we know that. Um, and his 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 speaking style was, you know, it, it involved some different different areas of range and tonality and things like that. And FDR, he would have these huge leaps, the little bump, way down like that. And uh, uh, Nehru, everything was right in this like one little spot. So uh, so his piece, you know, the thematic material was was in a very limited range, but um, cadence in the speech itself, yeah. So if you're listening to the overall speech, sometimes just the, the, the movement and the pacing, the breaths, yeah. all those things can create uh, an experience for me that, that can be very moving just on its own, just the, the, the flow of it. So let's talk about the, the president who is of greatest interest here in Austin, Texas and at the LBJ Library, namely Lyndon Baines Johnson. You chose his American Promise speech, this momentous speech that he gives on March 15th, 1965, just shortly after the dramatic episode on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma at a time when momentum was building for the passage of what became the Voting Rights Act of 1965, perhaps the high point of the Johnson presidency. What in, what in particular about that speech drew, or led you to include it uh, as one of your eight? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, again, my parents being civil rights active, activists, this particular time, 1965, I was five years old. I was aware a bit about things around me, not at any deep level politically, certainly. I do remember JFK getting shot and killed, my, my dad crying when he was reading the paper. But um, I think that you know you listen to different different speeches, and like I said before, if it moves moves you emotionally, some of that is based on the importance of the speech, the timing, the timeliness of the speech. And yes, he had he had gotten through um, Congress the the civil rights bill before, in I think July nineteen sixty four, I think it was, and uh, he was actually working on the Voting Rights Act, but secretly because he didn't want to overwhelm the Congress with the ideas of these things. And he was, he was being very political about it. So he had been secretly working on that. And then when Selma, Al Alabama, the, the Pettus Bridge uh, uh, tragedy occurred, everybody came to him and was like, look, you've got to do something. You've got to, we've got to, you know, so um, he, eight days later, he came to Congress and he made that speech. And of course, he had been working on it, but the speech had to be written for that purpose. And uh, it's an incredible speech. It's one of the most, I think, one of the most amazing political speeches ever. Now, I want to get into your, your, your process for converting the spoken word in, into music. But to set the stage, let's take a look at an excerpt from LBJ speaking before the nation on March 15th, 1965. 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the Congress, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions and of all colors, from every section of this country to join me in that cause. At times, history and fate meet at a single time, in a single place, to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. I mean, that's incredible, even that little excerpt. Right there, that little piece right there kind of kind of spells it all out. And that's the excerpt, that's the piece that I used, that I transcribed uh, to use for the thematic material of the piece. So talk about that, that process of, of transcription. How do you go about converting the spoken word into music? And we'll, we'll play some of the music in, in, in just a minute. I was really impressed by an interview that I saw of, of yours from a little while ago where you say that really you can convert any sound into, into music, a car horn, something dropping on the floor. <laughs> uh, tell, me about, tell me about how you, uh, you, you create music out of ordinary sounds. We hear them as sounds. Often we don't really associate pitches with them. And our voices certainly, if we started thinking about, oh, that's a G, that's an F, that's a C sharp all the time, of course, musicians aren't going to, I mean, non-musicians aren't necessarily going to be thinking in those terms, but we'd be going crazy. So we just sort of accept the sound that comes out at us as a sound. We don't really break it down in terms of the actual pitches of the sound, of the, of the different sounds that come at us. But um, when, you, when you put your attention towards, towards those sounds and isolate what the pitch is, you can, you can, you can find it and say, okay, that's an A. Um, and this is what this when I talked about the challenge of creating a piece of music, something that would uh, kind of force me to deal with a new um, approach to composing. I thought this was a really good one because what I could do is now listen to the speech. And I, this is this is what I did. We were on the road. We were on tour. We were on our tour bus, and I had my keyboard, my laptop, and I had down, downloaded uh, the speech, this, this um, American Promise speech, and um, and I just had my keyboard. And it, he said, "For the dignity of man, whatever." I would like, okay, and I would play the notes, and I said, "Wait, wait, I missed one." And so I had this, I had this notebook. Actually, I'll share this with you. This is my notebook, and I've got pages and pages of like this. So you see, I speak tonight for the dignity of man, and it's. You know, um, it's it's all just a bunch of random notes at this point. So I've isolated all these pitches. I wrote the words over, and um, and so this this way, I I kind of kept track of all the pitches, and I knew I'd come back to it because I'd have to refine it. So that's exactly what I did. Is I came back and I um, and I created this kind of more re a refinement of that. So you can see um, where I say. I speak tonight for the dignity of man. And the thing is, like, sometimes he'll, he'll land on a note, man, or he'll fall off. So sometimes you're in between pitches, and you have to kind of decide how to isolate the pitches. But you see here um, how I've kind of put it into a context. So, so once I get all these notes and the pitches, I mean, well, okay, great. Now what, what do you do, right? Because you just have a bunch of pitches. So now uh, you think about a context. And for me, I thought about the 60s. And for me, if I think about the music of the 60s, I think about uh, free jazz and kind of more avant-garde jazz. Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, people like that. And uh, I wanted to put it into some kind of a form that, that sounded like free jazz. So I broke it down and then I analyzed it and I put it into this, this context of bars and, and everything. And then I had to decide on har harmony. So I created a chordal structure. So I stretched out the notes a little bit so that it would fit into the time so that I could change the chords at a certain time. So when you listen to the piece, it doesn't follow exactly the cadence 
that LBJ had when he spoke the piece. So I've actually kind of played with that a little bit, but um, it is all the pitches. And then I created this long kind of piece, this long form and uh, kind of fast. And then it became like an avant-garde sixties jazz piece. And, uh, and it was so much fun to do that. And I would never have written a melody like that. Never. I would never have thought to put those notes together that way, just randomly. So it, 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 it kind of forced me to have to come up with something new in terms of how to support that thematic material, you know? Ted, I know you're, you're sitting next to a piano. Can you perhaps play us a little bit of music to give us a sense of how you handled uh, a particular phrase or a particular part of the speech that you found significant? Yeah, I can do that. So um, let me share. Here's actually the range that he did. So he says, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. Those are the pitches. It says, I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions, right? He goes down like that. And then he says, um, I, and I love this next phrase. He says, and of all colors from every section of this country. And this is so perfect to join me in that cause. At times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a touring point. Yeah, this is a it man's unending search for freedom. So that's, that's the piece that I actually uh, transcribed for this. So it sounds a bit random. So then to have to take that and, and come up with a chord structure that supports it, that doesn't just sound, because here's the thing, it's like you're, you're making music and you don't want it just to sound like crazy and random. You actually want to make it cohesive and make it feel like music. So that was the challenge for me. But I mean, it was incredible. You see the range of it. You see the movement of it, and the, the variety of intervals and, and everything. It was so much fun to work with. Right. And it, the, the, the finished product, if I understand it, is not such that you could literally sit there with a copy of the speech and sort of follow along. There, there are creative decisions that feed into your process that alter the, the flow to some extent. Is that a fair way to think about it? It would depend on probably the person who's who's paying attention to it, because I think you can I think everybody has a good ear. Most most people people say oh, I have a tin ear, but it's actually not true. People have good ears. If people were to uh, listen to the speech and get used to the sound of it and try to listen to it in that way and then put on this music, the melody, the way that I outlined it in the beginning of the piece is very direct and very clear. It's a big unison. And uh, I think you can actually hear the speech. I would, I would like to challenge people to, to try to do that. It would be very interesting. And I would love to hear what the experience is like for people to, to try to isolate the, the right. speech in their mind and listen to the music. When you performed this at the Lincoln Center and I'm sure many other places, um, did you provide the text of the speeches for the audience in some expectation that they could or might try to follow along? No, there were so many ideas that I had about that. I, I even thought about projecting the video and then us playing along with the video um, in, t in, like in time with his speech. That created a whole lot of problems that were financial and technical. And so, um, but you can find people who have done things like that. There's a great composer named Hermeto Pasquale um, who has taken like a, like a soccer match or something and he's he's created chordal structure that goes along with the person who's announcing the soccer match. So some people have done that using the original recordings and putting stuff on top of layering on top of it. Um, so this was done, done differently. Uh, it gave us more, a little bit more flexibility as well. Let's take a look at the video of uh, a section of the performance that you gave at the Lincoln Center.
Yeah, so, I mean, you can hear the kind of sort of modern jazz uh, approach that the band takes on this. And it, and it seems so appropriate for that time in mid-60s when the, when the speech was, uh, was made. Um, and the band is swinging. I mean, and, and the funny thing is that Winton wasn't on this concert. One of the things that Winton was was experimenting with was uh was the stepping back and allowing the band to do things on their own. And so, I, uh, but he ends up on the, re the recording and he plays an incredible solo on this LBJ piece that is I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> now, the music is interspersed with um with uh. The, the spoken word with uh, speakers orating the sections of the speeches that, that you have chosen to make music out of. Uh, Sam Waterston did, if I recall correctly, the uh, LBJ speech that's part of the album. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of selecting the right people to do the readings, uh, to complement the music and to capture what it is you're trying to capture about the speeches themselves? It's uh, a great question. For the original concert, we really could only have one, you know, for logistical um, reasons and financial, probably we only could have one speaker do, to do all the speeches. And Charles Dutton was an amazing choice just because of his passion and, and the fact that he, he has certain personal connections to a lot of these speeches. Um, when it came time to doing the record, Kabir Segal, who's my producer, and I uh, talked a lot about how to approach that. And at first I was thinking about having one speaker. And then we started thinking, you know, each speech has such a different personality and has such a different strength and different flow. And, and wouldn't it be great to connect people to the speeches that may have some kind of real personal connection to that speech? And Kabir, who um, just, he's just one of these people. He's like so charmed. He just happens to meet people at the right time. Um, and uh, he, he had met Joe Lieberman. And Joe said the reason why he got into public service was because of JFK's first inaugural speech. So to have him come in and read that for the record was like, I mean, how beautiful is that? Um, uh, Glenn Close had worked with us before and had, had read some uh, pieces and we worked with her in, in the context of something kind of similar that dealt, dealt with a uh, political kind of freedom. And uh, so she had become a pretty good friend. So I asked her to do uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi and she recommended Sam Waterston. She said, Sam would be great for this. So I called Sam and, and he was like, yeah, sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I felt, so, I felt so excited to be with these icons for me, I, actors that I had watched for so many years and then to work with them, be in the studio and, and even direct them. It, you know, it was, it, it was uh, a little daunting, but also very, very exciting. And in the case of uh, Mandela, we had Andrew Young, the civil rights, you know, the ambassador, uh, read that speech. And it just so happens that's, that's Kabir's godfather. So Kabir, my, my, uh, my producer, grew up in Atlanta and his father was a businessman and uh, very, very involved with different uh, uh, politicians at, at different times and met Andrew Young. So we were able to just bring in people that had some kind of a connection. David Miliband read, read the, uh, the Churchill speech and it was somebody that Kabir had met as well. So Kabir just, just, just kept running into these people like Deepak Chopra, who read the Nehru. I mean, how perfect is that? Someone, Nehru was somebody who inspired Deepak Chopra so much when he was a child. He remember seeing him in person uh, coming through his town. So uh, yeah, I think for people to put on the record and just listen to the speeches, but if they knew how important these speeches were to these individual readers, I think it would give them a little additional uh, boost when they're listening to it. You know. Going back for a second to, to your process, which I find so fascinating, um, is it more important for you to understand the speech as it is written on paper, or are you relying more on the authoritative delivery of that speech, the, the spoken word, which right. is more important, or maybe they're inseparable? No, I think I, it, it's a great question because like sometimes you're focusing on just the delivery of it, just the feeling of it. Sometimes it's really about what is, what is it saying? What are the words? And a lot of times the context, I mean, JFK, his first, this is the first speech that the first inauguration on color TV. I mean, it had a certain kind of impact. Uh, LBJ's speech came in an incredibly important uh, time. Um, so for me, those 
emotional contexts were extremely important and political and, 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 and the rights. Uh, for me, Nehru, it wasn't that personal. It was 1947. It was way before I was born. Uh, but it was important for India, who had just gotten uh, their rights uh, at the stroke of midnight. They became an independent country. Um, so the context became a little less personal for me, more about, OK, he's Indian. Um, there's a certain kind of a classical music in India that is odd time signatures and has a certain kind of vamp oriented stuff. It's very rhythmic and very groove oriented. So I focused on how I could interpret his background, his country, the time of the century that this took place and the way he spoke, which I mentioned earlier, is very like this. So I created this very, and so the speech itself became secondary almost like the, the, the thematic material became secondary to the groove, to the odd time signature, other things that for me represented India and gave me sort of a fun musical way to play like that. So each one had a completely, like really made me think completely differently about how I'm gonna approach composing. So. What about with LBJ? Did you find that uh, you were influenced by certain elements of his background or personality that really went beyond the simple way in which he reads that speech? Yeah, I mean, the fact that he's a Texan you know, it had a certain kind of, you know, uh, that kind of, yeah, he had a you know, way he would talk and he was very direct and he, he, he wasn't a quiet speaker. He was very, but I think there was a certain kind of honesty about him. Like you knew, you knew that what he was saying was authentic. It was genuine. And we know a lot of political speakers who are very slick. I mean, Reagan was an actor. He said beautiful things at times, but you could feel the slickness of it. LBJ was not slick. I didn't want this piece to be slick either, but I also wanted it to have a little bit of a kind of a tongue in cheek reference to Texas. So at the very beginning of the piece, it goes, you know, so I, I throw that in there and it's like, it's obvious, but it's yeah. fun and it's for me. And it's, and then, but then I start to do, you know, like where I started to do things like, you know, So I started to create these layers that became, okay, I'm taking this little cell and I'm building upon it and layering it. And it becomes more and more complicated just as, as LBJ is a complicated person. I mean, we, we know he must've been complicated. His role in politics was complicated. I mean, he, you know, he took over as a vice president when uh, uh, from vice president to president, I mean, he was a, he was a very popular second term, right? I mean, his second term was uh, he, one in a landslide. I think people really related to his personality and his honesty. And, you know, we've seen a lot of that now, but the message is, is, has been very different, you know? <laughs> I think a lot of um, historians and biographers have this idea that LBJ was, was fantastic in one-on-one in -on -one settings with small groups even. He was incredibly persuasive and very personable, really dominating personality, could really light up a room. But in front of a crowd, he was not so effective. Would you, would you challenge that idea and, and perhaps uh, suggest that we should take another look? I, I wouldn't challenge that. And, mm -hmm. and I have to also, uh, a disclaimer, I'm not necessarily a historian. So uh, my background isn't so much, you know, really going deep into his history and, and, and everything, and, and certainly on the po political side. But, um, and there's a beautiful movie, right? That Brian Cranston plays uh, LBJ. And I think that does such a great job, at least what I think is probably pretty accurate representation of LBJ. And I think he, what you're saying about him being really great one-on-one -on -one is because he just, he could, but in front of people, now you've got people judging you and looking at you. And uh, yeah, he probably, he probably wasn't as comfortable in front of a huge group of people. That's not how, how he did things. He probably did a lot of his deals on a lot of his stuff, you know, with one person in the room or just a couple people. Um, so to stand up in front of Congress with this speech at that time with everybody looking at him, I mean, Martin Luther King was listening live on the radio. He cried when he heard this. It was so important. And he had a, of course, he had a speech writer. I mean, I know these are his ideas. He, he, know, he, he knew the importance of and the meaning behind everything he was saying, but he did have somebody write the speech for him, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Richard, Richard Goodwin? Goodwin? Richard Goodwin. Goodwin. Exactly. Yeah.
So anyone who's interested in LBJ is almost bound to be interested in JFK. And I can't resist asking you for a little bit of insight into how you tried to capture his background and his personality to supplement the actual words of his famous inaugural address. <laughs> that, that's interesting. Yeah. So again, a lot of the choices that I make musically, I don't explain to anybody, right? So I'm, I'm going to explain stuff to you, but it's interesting because it's personal. I realize that people don't know why I choose a particular form or context for something. With, with JFK, I had the same situation I had with LBJ. I had a bunch of random notes, hmm. but I didn't want it to be a free piece. It was the 60s or early 60s. Um, I wanted it to be more clear. I felt that JFK was very clear. He was also, I, you know, again, these are my personal re re reflections, but I felt a certain machismo, right? I mean, I felt like a certain sort of macho quality to JFK. And we hear stories about things about him. And, and uh, so I wanted it to have a kind of a strong feel in that way. So I, I decided the context of a blues, a blues and F. That was, that was what I chose. And then, um, but I made it a shuffle. So it has this real kind of strong edge, like things rolling forward. And I think about even the motorcade and things like that, that were images that were very strong in, um, in my brain. Um, so, you know, it's like this kind of, um, um, kind of rolling forward shuffle that has a certain sort of drive to it. Cause I think about him as having a certain kind of drive. So, but I wanted to put it into a context of a blues and see what the challenge would be for me musically to fit all these notes that might not necessarily be in the key of F, but put it into an F blues. And that was a challenge. And I saw so put it on the trombones. I put the trombones in an upper register so that they're struggling a little bit. You now I wanted to, I wanted there to be some some kind of like mm, behind all of that. And uh, and for me that sort of satisfied certain feelings I had about about JFK. What did you learn through this process about what makes a politician inspiring or what makes political oratory inspiring and uplifting? You know, I, I think uh, as I was looking at these speeches, these the, the ones that really inspired me came at a particular time where where things were, were it was timely, it was an important. Um, I wrote down some ideas that I actually, when I was when, when I was actually getting ready to do this, and I wanted to create sort of a, I don't know, a checklist of things that needed to happen for me to choose a speech. And you asked me about that earlier. And I was thinking, these are some of the things. I said um, uh, that great political speeches combine three elements, a prominent orator, a uh, significant statement, and considerable eloquence. Right? These, these are the things that, that were important for me to choose a speech. And um, some of the criteria I also used in, in considering these speeches were the rhetorical brilliance, originality, historical importance, Right. I mean, the lasting influence, the delivery of it, and then just the inspirational quality of it that came from the, the speech itself and the time and the context. Ted, talk a little bit about what you hope people who listen to your work and hopefully view the amazing video and perhaps even hear one of your performances, what they'll take away. What is it that you want to leave your, your audience with? As a, as a musician and a composer, I think I, I'm just so happy that I'm getting older because it's like the things that were important to me when I was young, is, this is, you know, it changes over time. Like I could be more concerned with a particular chordal structure and the harmony that it suggests and stuff. And that became so important to me, but that's not that important to people. You know, that's, that is a small thing. So of course, I want people to like the music. I want them to listen to this music and say, wow, you know, um, that was inspiring or uh, that was different. And it made me think, you know, just, just the musical experience alone. I want people to have a feeling when they listen to it. Because one of the things about, I think, getting older is that you're, you're less inclined to focus on how to impress people. When we're younger, we want to impress people. When we're older, we want to move people. We want to inspire and move people. And, and, and that's the, the best thing that I could say 
would be a reaction from somebody is that it moved them. Now, this particular project, the music side, I would love people to, and to, to take this record as just a starting place, a jumping off point to listen to great speeches, listen to the excerpts on the record, listen to the music, have a good time with that. Um, go back and listen to these original speeches. Listen to LBJ's complete uh, speech of Congress in, in um, 1965. Uh, listen to the whole inauguration of JFK, Mandela's inauguration, um, uh, Nehru, all, Churchill talking about, you know, in the, in the beginning of World War II and, and just feeling so despondent and, and worried about the future of his country and how he talks about that and listen to it and listen to the beautiful, beautiful way he phrases everything. And, um, and then let that, I mean, this is what I would love is for people to take these speeches and be reminded of who, who we are, what can we do? How can we connect with people that are near us or far away from us, people that are different from us, that are like us, um, and realize that you know, there are things that we can do to help um, move these things along that we're working so hard to fix in this country. And so maybe we can find inspiration in these speeches. Maybe we can find things and phrases, like you picked out certain phrases that were timely for you to, to read now and make them little mantras or write them down investigate more speeches that have to do with this theme. And then maybe you'll find yourself being more active. Mm -hmm. I think everybody, if, there, if, if we, everyone just did a little something in terms of activity, I think we could, we could move things along in a way that we need to at this, at this point. So, I mean, it's asking a lot, but <laughs> if, or just listen to the speeches and just enjoy them. Ted Nash, thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure I speak on behalf of, everyone who has a chance to listen to this conversation in saying how blown away I am by the piece of music, the presidential suite, uh, really a, a wonderful contribution and a tremendous uh, way to talk about the history of the presidency. I think I've learned a lot as a historian and I'm very grateful to you for that and for taking the time to, uh, to do this event today. And I want to point out to our audience that copies of Ted's album, uh, presidential suite are available for sale at lbjstore.com. This is a really nice two disc set uh, that, that includes not only the music and the speeches, but also a very substantial um, uh, set of liner notes that with uh, a great deal to say about the history of these speeches and about Ted's work. Ted, thank you again for being with us. Very much appreciated. Oh, Mark, thank you so much for having me and allow me to to talk about all this with, with, with you, I mean, uh, connected to this uh, incredible um, library. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.